Hi, my name is Arturo O'Farrell. I'm the founder and artistic director of the Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance. And I want to welcome you to our Digital Village La Plaza Fridays. Uh, tonight's program is a rebroadcast of an opportunity I had to sit down with my friend and artistic collaborator and, and, and civil rights hero, Dr. Cornell West. It was originally recorded a couple of years ago at the Green Space in, uh, in a program called The Conversation on Jazz and Spirit. We were discussing at the invitation of the Green Space and through the auspices of the People's Performing Arts Center, the Apollo, the uh, performance of and commissioning of a piece that I called the Cornell West Concerto uh, based on the, the speech that Cornell West gave uh, in Seattle Town Hall uh, based on his book, Black Prophetic Fire, and it was an exegesis on the words of W.B. Du Bois and the souls of black folk, the four questions. Um, what I want to say is that uh, sitting with Cornell West is this it's 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 a treasure it's um you don't sit with cornell west and uh and have small talk it just cornell west says the most unbelievably impactive important and meaningful things i've ever heard um and the opportunity to sit with him at the uh studios of uh wnyc at the green space uh it's something that I, 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 you know, I will not ever forget. Uh, we had the chance to play with him, with the great Walter Stinson on the bass, and Carly Carlos Maldonado on the bass, on the, sorry, on the percussion, and it was moderated by WQXR's Helga Davis. It's a fascinating evening, um, and, you know, Cornell's a very controversial figure. He has said things that some intelligentsia on black and white sides, on conservative and liberal sides, he has said things that make intelligentsia and academia uncomfortable. Uh, you may hate him, you may love him, but he does what the prophets do. He says things that make us think. He holds our feet to the fire and he creates dialogue. He's the best kind of teacher in that he doesn't give answers he creates questions in our soul. And so I hope you enjoy this evening of conversation with Dr. Cornell West and glean as much uh, nourishment, intellectual and spiritual, from our time with him as I did. This is an evening of conversation with Dr. Cornell West. Good evening, everyone. I'm so, 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 so proud to be here and also really, really proud to be part of the Apollo family. And, you know, I was born in Harlem Hospital and I live in Harlem now and it just feels like this is an evening that has come full circle for me. So I'm very, very proud to be a part of this conversation, to be a part of the Apollo family, and thank you very, very much for having me, and I'm so glad to see all of you. Welcome to the Jerome L. Green Performance Space here at New York Public Radio. So, we've had a lot of introductions already, and maybe now it's time. Yes, time, time, it is time, okay. <laughs> We're here tonight to bring a composer and his inspiration together on stage to discuss the deep connections between jazz and spiritual tradition, traditions. So before the premiere of the Cornell West Concerto at the Apollo Theater on May 21st, let's explore why this work was made in the first place. In fact, why don't we just start with some music? Grammy Award-winning pianist, composer, and educator Arturo O'Farrell is the founder of the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra, which has been nominated many times for Grammy Awards and won for the orchestra's second album, Chico. He's composed commissioned, commissioned works for Meet the Composer, Symphony Space, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, and the Apollo Theater, among others. 
He's an artist in residence at the Harlem School of the Arts and Casita Maria Center for the Arts and Culture. And he's on the faculty of Brooklyn College and Manhattan School of Music. He's quite busy. <laughs> Please welcome to the Jerome L. Green performance space, Arturo O'Farrell. Hello. Go play. And just while we're here, Arturo this evening is being accompanied by Walter Stinson, who's our bassist, and Carlos Maldonado, our percussionist. Give them a hand, please. Thank you. 
Arturo, come on over here and say hello to me. And uh, Walter and Carlos, don't go too far. We're going to have you come back for sure. Hi. Hi. What was that? <laughs> it was a piece I wrote called 24 Hours in the Life of a Dog. Um, in, uh, in Havana and in Cuba, dogs are considered sacred. Um, and it is not unusual to watch traffic come to a complete stop uh, when a dog uh, presents itself in the street. And um, it's not unusual for a person to work 24 hours a day in Cuba. And it's not unusual uh, for dancers and artists and musicians to work that hard just to survive. And uh, it's a piece that was written for a great group of Cuban dancers, the Malpaso Dance Company in Havana. And uh, they asked me to write uh, an overture to a ballet of my music. And it was ostensibly about the 24 hours in the life of a dancer. And uh, you know, sometimes it feels like we are up against a lot of struggle and uh, get tired, but we keep on. Tell me <laughs> a little bit about how you feel that piece connects to jazz and spirituality, which is a big part of your conversation as an artist? I am, um, jazz is spirituality to me. Mm -hmm. Jazz is uh, about the deepest journey that a musician can take, which is the inward journey, the introspection journey. It's the biggest journey that a human being can make and it's the closest that we can come to understanding ourselves. And when a jazz musician uh, becomes vulnerable, uh, takes a risk and embraces improvisation in front of a group of people and demands to go deep inside themselves to explain their lives, their souls, their struggles, their pueblo. Um, that's some scary stuff. It is indeed. It reminds me, and if you'll allow me to tell this story a little bit, uh, one of my mentors who's actually here tonight, Mr. Harris, uh, Craig Harris. Craig. And what was very, very, hi Craig. Wow. So we had one of these nights, right? I was singing with Craig. And I know that when Craig plays and he takes the slide of the trombone and he pointed at you, it's time for you to blow. And so there was Craig, I was there, we were there, the band was killing. And Craig takes his slide and he points it at me. And in about four measures, I did everything I thought <laughs> I knew how to do. <laughs> I did everything. High, low, skibbly, bibbly, 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 bee. I was done. I was like, I just killed that. And then I noticed that Craig wasn't on the stage. Not only was Craig not on the stage, everyone in the band just kept playing and they were all looking at me. So when I did finally gather myself and understand the horror that was in front of me, I looked up and there was Craig in the back at the bar talking to someone. And I heard him yell from the back, go ahead and sing, girl. Yeah. 
And then you're right. You take another kind of journey. And you go inside and you find out you find out who you are. It's kind of like pointing a mirror, having a mirror pointed at you. And I don't know that I've ever sung like that again. I hope to sing like that again. But maybe it's a, a first time thing, you know, where you're so completely freaked out. And, <laughs> and you go in and you find out who you are. And I feel a little bit like this piece that you're working on with Dr. West must also be that kind of journey. Talk about it a little bit. Oh, wow. <laughs> a little it, bit. It's abandonment. I mean, uh, it's funny because uh, uh, we were in the green room talking uh, with Dr. West and he spoke about um, love is, is scary and, mm. um, and uh, creating something that is different or unique or that has never been done before is really, really terrifying. And um, I don't know how to set uh, the brilliance and intellect of this man to music, but I knew I had to. And so there's a sense of abandonment to that. There's a sense of, well, I don't know what the process is, but I have no choice. It's inside my soul to do this. Um, and that to me is, again, it's like, it, and he said this uh, earlier, he said it's a, a, like being in love, being, giving of yourself in a way that you don't know what's gonna happen. You could be hurt, you could be destroyed, whatever it is, you could be rejected. Um, and that's okay. And that's actually quite okay. And in a way, um, this piece is very, very new ground for me. Very, very In what way? Um, Okay, for instance, finding melodic substance. There's sections in the piece where Dr. West speaks and I orchestrate that. So first I had to transcribe the rhythm of his speaking. Mm -hmm. He does not speak like this in a monotone, saying the same thing in the same manner for three sentences. I mean, this is a man who swoops and swirls and flies and tumbles and leaps and goes all over the place. And, and you have to figure out those rhythms mm. and set them to sometimes they're tuplets, quintuplets, sextuplets, septuplets. Sometimes they're just quarter notes. Who knows? But you have to find a way to do that. And I didn't want to do the obvious thing, which is just to orchestrate what he says. But I also wanted to punctuate things he does and things that I think are important I wanted to bring out. And so I would, you know, figure out how to join, sync up with some of what he says and then to detract to unclump from it if you will um so that you can have a, a you know hopefully some sort of support for uh what he's what he's saying which is so important for us to hear that's the thing the thing other thing that's frightening to me about this piece is that there's so many things that dr west says that must be heard mm -hmm. they must be heard that's a huge responsibility to take the words seriously enough to make them you have to do everything in your power to make those words heard. One of the things that I love that you said when we spoke a little bit before this evening was that Dr. West is himself an instrument. So he's, he's the fifth member of the band, if you will. Oh yeah. Uh, so that the words and the speaking you hear also as music, not just words. Well, that's what happened. The, the, I, I'd seen uh, Dr. West many times on video and followed his uh, writings. But when I saw him live, I'm telling you, at one point he was speaking and I saw, I see music, by the way. I, hear, I don't hear it so much. I don't hear it so much as, as see it sometimes. Um, music is very visual to me. And I watched Dr. West speak and I saw shapes and colors and melodies and notes just start to swirl around his head. I know I'm ready for the loony farm. <laughs> please don't call the guys in the white jackets yet, please. <laughs> but he started to do this and I went, wow, I have to capture this because that's what art does. Art captures truth and demands attention. Can it. you put it a little bit in the context of your own musical history? Also, talk about your father a little bit. Talk Easily. About My father was a truth teller. He uh, did not like to replicate. He yeah. did not like to uh, institutionalize. He liked to challenge. Uh, he was given so many opportunities to uh, write another mambo. And instead, what he wrote was a 12-tone row bembe with 
overtones of Stravinsky. I mean, it's just, yeah, you know, <laughs> he was not someone who was content to sit on his laurels. And again, I think that speaks to the kind of calling that is upon all artists. This is not endemic to me. This is not my role. This is the role that all artists should be engaged in to challenge and progress and move forward, even at the risk of being rejected, even at the risk of failing. Um, I don't know how to live any other way, and I think I learned that from my father. Mm. How's the orchestra doing? They're beside themselves. They, they don't know what to make of this moment. They, <laughs> first of all, I write difficult music sometimes, so we send it on ahead of them, ahead of time for them to look at, and they're all calling me going, what are you, how are we supposed to play this? It's not sight reader friendly. I said, you know what? <laughs> Most great things in life aren't sight reader friendly. Mm. <laughs> how do you feel that the, the piece is... Um, I don't know, how to, relevant to where we are now as a culture, uh, as Americans, as, I don't know, name something. Where, where, does it, where does it put us? How does it move us forward? Where are we in the conversation with it? And it's music. You know, we had a, I interviewed someone, um, not so long ago, who said she was a little bit disappointed, uh, or she has moments of being disappointed that she isn't a doctor or, or a lawyer, or something that she felt was more quote unquote useful to the society. And I really had to challenge her uh, around that kind of thinking because after all, it is we who will solve this mess, I think, in the end, and I don't think I'm the only one who feels that way, but talk a little bit about where the piece sits in that conversation uh, about healing and about moving us forward. You really can't heal um, unless you know you have an illness. You can't begin to seek treatment if you deny the uh, ugliness inside our inside our very soul. As a nation, we harbor some truly violent uh, a history and a continuation of, of unbridled, unrepentant capitalism, of uh, deep-rooted, institutionalized, and blatant racism. And uh, so many people think that uh, it's all Trump's doing, that it has been brought out into the open, and I, I don't agree. I think the uh, racism and, and income inequality and disparity and the way we treat our uh, minority and poor and elderly has is, is been an endemic. Again, I love that word. I'm sorry, I just used that word too many times. Whoa, that is so cool. Little blue car action there, ADHD. Um, sorry. But, but we, are, we need to recognize that, that, that we have some serious problems, man. And it's some really, really... It's frightening to me. I, I could have never imagined being from New York. Um, all of us who are New Yorkers have disliked this man for 30 years. Um, and it's, it, I, we always thought he was a fool and a failure. Uh, we could never have imagined that he would sell his tomfoolery and stupidity and ugliness to the nation. Um, it's a shock to me. It's a shock to me that he did. I don't understand. I don't know. I don't know what to think. It well, freaks me out. Well, you have the piece to to tell us what you think, right? <laughs> and it's so great that uh, that you that you that we have a vehicle for our our uh, the ways in which we are dissatisfied with our country, with our society, with our friends, with our parents. We have, we have music as that vehicle. You know what, before we bring out Dr. West, will you play something else? I would us? love to, I really would. Thank I'd you. I'd be happy to. Please welcome again Arturo O'Farrell. Come Walter and Carlos. How many of you already have your tickets for the show on the 21st, that's great. And the rest of you? Yes.
Arturo. That's how we do it in the green space. Arturo O'Farrell, Walter Stinson, and Carlos Maldonado. Please give them another hand. So you know what we're gonna do now, right? No. Sure you do. We're gonna bring him out. <laughs> That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna bring him out. Dr. Cornell West is a professor of philosophy and Christian practice at the Union Theological Seminary and author of more than 20 books, including most recently, Black Prophetic Fire and The Radical King. He's a champion of social and racial justice. He writes, he teaches, he speaks about the traditions of the Black Baptist Church, progressive politics, and jazz. He's made three spoken word albums, collaborating with Gerald Levert, Jill Scott, KRS-One, and the late Prince. Please, please, please give a very, very warm Jerome L. Green space Apollo welcome. <laughs> to Dr. Cornell West. Come on and sit down right there oh, in the middle sounds chair. Good to me. Sounds Let us good get to you me. from the two sides. Absolutely. What a blessing to sit next to you. How about that? Thank I'm you, sir. You, Thank Lord you very much. Blessing me right now. I know that song, <laughs> yes indeed. Tell us, Dr. West, what you're doing up there at the Apollo. Well, I tell you, to sit here next to this brother Arturo, y'all heard him play this piano, good God Almighty, and to be able to look out and see Sister Pro Cockle from the legendary family, long, long distance runners for justice, as the Law Greer so very kind, the Apollo's consecrated space. So you come in with a profound sense of humility. It is the most democratic space in the history of the country that has produced aristocrats, <laughs> artists. When we talking about the Sarah Vaughns and the Stevie Wonders, that is spiritual nobility. And there's so many others, the James Browns, the Michael Jacksons, and so forth and so on. So it's fascinating on that Wednesday night, you really do get profound democratic decision making. <laughs> and the result is the highest level of artistic excellence. That's what I call an aristocratic artist. And so for me just to come in and be just a little small, small, small moment along with my brother towering artist that he is. Just makes me uh, want to break dance. <laughs> yeah. Makes me want to break dance. Oh, yes. Doesn't I'm get too much sure better than that. I'm not sure that we have insurance for that. But. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes you don't need insurance when the spirit hits, though. You know what I mean? There you go. Yeah. You have assurance. <laughs> blessed assurance. I got blessed assurance. Amen. Oh, there you go. All there right. you go. That's right. Blessed right. usher. That would trump insurance any day, won't it? <laughs> oh. There we go. Oh, yeah. Lord. <laughs> Tell me something. How did the like two the of end you of the meet? Concerto. How did the two of you meet? It was sheer providence. Okay. It was sheer providence. Uh, because uh, we were at a, uh, well, I saw you in a jazz club, of course, many times. But when we actually met, we were at the, uh, a, a rally struggling against police brutality, Carl Dix, and many of us had gone to jail fighting stop and frisk, and he was a part of it. Brother Arturo, as artist, as jazz musician, part of the struggle, part of the demonstration, and then walked up to me and said, could we do something together? Uh, first, they, they got to tell the whole story, Cornell, because <laughs> here's what happened. I, 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 you know, I was, I heard Cornell at a, at a, at a dialogue and uh, wanted to write for him and uh, I knew he was speaking at this rally and it's a rally that I was invited to be a part of because those are also my causes that I love and live for and um, and Cornell came in and he had a sore throat and he'd been flying all night from God knows where and uh, he began to speak man and it was electrifying people 
um, at the end of the, it was like the Victrola. You ever see the Victrola ad with the hair swept back? And the pe- <laughs> Cornell finished speaking, and people were like, <laughs> and it was the, literally the most amazing thing I'd ever heard in my life. And the next thing I know, the master of ceremony says, and now we'll have a word from Arturo O'Farrell. <laughs> <laughs> and I got up and I just shared, because you, what can you do after you hear Cornell West speak? All you can do is open your heart and let the words come forth, because that's all that we have. And uh, uh, Brother West was kind enough to come up to me and say thank you. That was powerful. You were eloquent, eloquent, bro. that's <laughs> wisdom speaking. And that's when I said, uh, Dr. West, do you think uh, you, you could do a project with us? And uh, he was so kind, and he said yes, and we've been dealing ever since. Dr. West, talk to us about the intersection of your life as a musician and your life as a theologian and philosopher and teacher and activist and justice seeker. Tell us about where those things intersect with this new work that you're doing together. Mm. Well, I just begin on the very concrete reality that I am who I am because somebody loved me. So I come out of Irene and Clifton West and Shiloh Baptist Church on the chocolate side of Sacramento, California. And in that family and in that church, there's a musicality that constitutes who we are. So music is not ornamental or decorative. It's not something added on. See, I don't believe in this bourgeois notion of art somehow being compartmentalized. That art constitutes the very source of from whence we come. Mm. And it's the very means by which we, or at least me, preserve my sanity. And of course, that's always an open question as to <laughs> when it's going to kick in and when it's not. But <laughs> preserve my sanity and my dignity, really. So there's a musicality in living, trying to be an artist of life as well as someone who appreciates those who are willing to give their big hearts based on the mastery of craft and technique to us so we can revel in their heart and in their soul to help us and empower us as we make our way from mama's womb to tomb. Did you have an aha moment though? I know, I know it sounds banal to ask this question, but I, I mm. wonder still what what was the moment when it was clear to you that these things were not separate questions, that you, that you, that they were one force, one energy moving through you and that, that you would not compartmentalize or, or separate them? Was there someone you heard? Was there a, a particular, I don't know. Mm. And for you too, Arturo, I'm I'm curious. I'd like to hear what my brother got to say. You know, there, there was actually there was there was an ah, there was an aha moment. There was an aha moment because, uh, uh, you know, I was a dutiful little uh, musician and I took piano lessons and kind of dug it and was listening to Elton John and kind of you know. And then I, my father had his record collection. Don't ask me why under lock and key. <laughs> but I broke in one day and I pulled out a record and on the cover was this angry looking black man and his face tore into my heart and I put the record on and it was Seven Steps to Heaven, Miles Davis. Mm. And the second that, that music started, my soul was liberated in a way that I, and this is true, this is just absolutely, I couldn't put it any other way, it was liberated. And especially when I heard Herbie Hancock begin to play a solo, that I did not understand why up until that point I wanted to be a musician, but at that point I did. And I realized that what, what this man was doing at the piano was uh, life-changing and life-giving. And that was my aha moment. Dr. West, you have an you aha know, moment? Mine is much less profound than that. <laughs> <laughs> it really is because it's really a matter of uh, just growing up in the neighborhood and, and going to church and having a deep appreciation of the musicality of the preaching. We had musical ushers who just knew how to do that thing with, with rhythm just in the way they walked in and out of the church. 
and I, I appreciated that. I still do. Uh, but, and and as, as I grew up, it was really rhythm and blues. It was Curtis Mayfield. It was a genius of Curtis Mayfield. Sly Stone used to play Fifth Sunday every Sunday in my church with North California uh, Mass Choir. He was Sylvester then, but we know him as a genius that he is, Sly Stone. Uh, uh, it was Smokey Robinson. It was Stevie Wonder. It was Aretha. It was Gladys. All of these folk were members of the family in terms of our soul. Uh, communion in that sense. And so I didn't really get to Coltrane and the others until I was in my uh, uh, late teenage years when I recognized, when I heard Love Supreme, I just said, oh, Lord have mercy. I'm so glad you oh, said that. Lord have mercy. What so, is this? I'm so, 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 so <laughs> what glad is you said this? that. What is train doing? When my brother one of my eldest brother came back from Vietnam yes. and for a very, very long time, my mom had a trunk that no one was allowed to open. And so, of course, I opened it. <laughs> <laughs> and inside that trunk was Love Supreme. And I put it on and I, like you, Arturo, I had no idea what I was listening to except that I couldn't stop listening to yeah. it. And I felt that there was some correlation between that music and the way that generation of African American men came back into the community in Harlem. And it was also a very, very powerful record mm. for me. Mm. Oh, look how nice I can say we have that in common oh. now. No, that's powerful. That's powerful. You know who told me that I was with Bootsy in Cincinnati? We were in his, what he called the Rehabilitation Center, which is his studio. And he said, and he's a genius now, Bootsy's a genius. And he said, when he heard Love Supreme, he had to play it over and over again for three days. Ooh. For three days. That's the kind of impact it had. Right. And, and there's something that's going on in terms of the moans and groans and the guttural cries of a hated people teaching the world so much how to love. Hmm. Uh, but people who are treated so unjustly but teaching the hmm. world so much about justice. Hmm. Justice is what love looks like in public anyway. Just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. And there's a tenderness in train. There's a tenderness in Miles' music. Now his life is something else. <laughs> but in his music, there's a gentleness mm -hmm. there. And the same is true. You had to play an Otis Redden. Try a little tenderness. <laughs> and he sings it tenderly. Yes. But with strength and vulnerability. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's the tradition that I come out of. You see. I've I been wanna, very blessed. I'm sorry. I uh, want to ask both of you what you feel the most promising light is in today's culture of jazz. What do you hear that, that inspires you, that gives you hope, that, I mean, you're already in a very, very deep conversation, yeah? But uh, what else inspires you? Hmm. Wow, that's a heavy. That's a heavy question. No, it's not so heavy. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, I, you know, I always find that as an educator, uh, we're, we're, we're always forced to codify what we give to educate and mold young jazz musicians. I hate all those words because I find that at the end of the day, uh, every young musician I've ever met who has an open heart and an open mind educates me. And what I found is that quite to the contrary, I know less about this craft than I did when I began. And I know less about this craft than, than I did when I began. And so, um, you know, wow, the, the future of jazz is in good hands. So not necessarily in the conservatory hands, although that happens sometimes. But it's in the hands of young men and women who are forward looking and are mixed, they're mixing it up. They're realizing this gift uh, can find its expression in Peruvian festejo music. It can find its expression in Balkan brass music. It can find its expression in contemporary uh, turntable electronica. It can find its expression in traditional quartet settings. 
but they're pushing forward with progress and vision because they know that the essence of this music is to move forward. That's mm. what mm. happened when Louis Armstrong started singing scat. And people said, what's wrong with him? He's crazy. Or when you know Louis Armstrong heard Charlie Parker and called it Chinese music. I don't know what Charlie Parker thought of John Coltrane, but I don't imagine it's not, you know, before that, and it goes on and on and on. And the more we sit and ensconce ourselves in what affirms us and what identifies us, the less we are likely to experience challenge. Mm. For you, Dr. West? Yeah, I think that we live in a moment of deep decay and decadence uh, where uh, commodification is ubiquitous where everything's for sale and everybody's for sale, including the music. So too many musicians are not in it for the music, they're in it for the money. Uh, that's always been a challenge, but it's worse now than it's ever been, you see. And so when I look at the brother Arturo, he's in it for the music. Javon Jackson's in it for the music. Brother Harris, in it for the music. Yes, uh, uh, Jerry Allen's in it for the music. We have some who carry it, on, but it's weaker and weaker. It's like the death of Aunt Esther in August Wilson's 10 play cycle. He dies in the mid 80s because the, the money has taken over the soul. And you can't be soulful if it's only about the music. That's right. The land, the dusty desert of dollars and smartness. You see, jazz is not into smartness. Jazz is into wisdom, courage, vision, willingness to put your life on the line and go to life, the edge of life's abyss and see what your heart looks like, Amen. no matter how Amen. broken it is and offer it to somebody else. Amen. That's not money. Now, you hope you make somebody doing it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but the commodification is very, very real. And this affects all of us in our own lives, but this is especially so when it comes to something that is so consecrated as that which has preserved a people who have been terrorized and traumatized and, terror and, and, and stigmatized for 400 years, but still dished up a love supreme. What's going on? Beloved, James Baldwin essays. That's the tradition mm -hmm. that I think we're in the process of uh, uh, not so much losing, but it's hard to preserve. That's why the moment in uh, the Grammys with brother Kendrick Lamar was so crucial. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's the whole. That sight of massive spectacle, image glitz and blitz, here come the truth, the chains. Put that right on the microphone and started flowing. You can feel right. the voices of Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith mm -hmm. and Billy and Ella That's shot right. through Kendrick. And of course, he's named after a genius from Birmingham named Eddie Kendrick. Kendrick. Lamar, that's his mama making that connection between right. past and present, you see. Yeah. So in that sense, you know, I'm a prisoner of hope, but I'm, I'm not optimistic. You know what I would like to do? I'd like to take some questions from you, the audience. Uh, let's see, I think what we're setting up two microphones here. If you have any questions, we don't have time for a lot of questions, but I'd love to hear what you're thinking, what you'd like to ask. Anyone? No. <laughs> really? Well, come and step up to a microphone, please, so that we want to be sure that we hear you and, uh, and that we get you properly. Yes. <laughs> please actually, tell us, please tell us I, your, listen, I have, please tell us your name. Yes, yeah, Ben Blakeney. Good evening. Good evening to you. So listen, you're gonna help me with this question, all right? What you have set up, I think, is the critical issue. How do you bridge where you brothers are at to where the younger generation is at, all right? Okay, yes. that's a great question. Yes, yes. You know, and, and, and let me tell you, I'm 59, and so when you consider what Jazz did when jazz evolved, you know, it advanced a sound that had never been heard before. And that sound aligned with a political and social movement that critically changed the profile of this country, right? We're at a place now where there's a gap. And we see, and I'm not gonna go through all the, you know, social metrics that suggest mm -hmm. that the gap is real. But the question is, 
what is it about what you did that can be translated to a generation that has to move forward and use the music and the culture as a way to communicate change it's a that you don't question. see now? It's a great question. Wow, yeah, I, um, I think the first thing you do is you Thank don't you. dismiss young people. We dismiss them and we uh, dismiss them and their culture and what they do and how they talk and how they dress and what they listen to and immediately we disenfranchise them, we alienate them and we become something that rightly so is of no relevance whatsoever. So we talking to kids like, like they don't exist and expecting them to care about jazz, to care about R&B, to care about, you know, uh, I hear too often from musicians uh, how uh, meaningless uh, hip hop is and uh, spoken word and it's not. In fact, musicians sometimes are scared because these young people are doing some brilliant music that we can't do. Kendrick, is a great example, man. He's mixing up 59 different planets and doing it like a master. But you will hear some older musicians go, ah, that ain't music, man, that, that man ain't man. You know what, that's jazz. Mm -hmm. Again, that's, that's the essence of jazz. That's the beginning and the end of the progress because we continue. And, 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 and really what happens is when we tell young people, oh man, I've, I've had conversations with, with all kinds of people and they always say, well, how can we get our young people involved in this music? And the first thing out of my mouth is embrace them, love them accept that they're intelligent, mm -hmm. accept that they know what they speak of and that they have incredible insight into their lives and don't discount it because you don't understand it. Um, and the power of jazz is, 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 is to me, it's more potent than ever because it is involving people like Hendrick and Lupe Fiasco and people right. who are pushing the envelope. And I'll tell you what, what you said that made a lot of sense to me. It isn't music and it isn't art until you connect it to the Pueblo. If you don't connect it to the Pueblo, you live in a vacuum. But, and that's, elite art does that very well. We don't have to participate in that nonsense. We don't have to sequester ourselves in an ivory tower. If you don't move yourself, your life, your essence, your art for the community, you're doing a half-assed job. Absolutely. I agree. Thank you. No, I just think that our young people haven't been loved enough. They haven't been cared for, they haven't been attended to enough. There's no train without the love of Monk and Miles right. and, and so many others who cultivated them. That's why when train got at the height, what did he do? He went to the younger generation. He went to Eric Dolphy and the others, bring the young folk in. I want a young pianist, McCoy. I could have gone with Red Garland. No, right. I'm going with young McCoy. See, he had that love coming at him and we got to direct the love to the younger generation. Too many young folk feel just rootless and deracinated and right. just drifting. I'll say this and then I'm off the microphone. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's talking about, you know, their epiphany, you know, that moment. You yeah. know, mine was when I went into my dad's collection huh. and heard Wes Montgomery. Ooh. Yeah. Now yeah, before yeah, yeah. that before that, you know, it was Marvin Gaye yes, and yeah. George Clinton. But oh, when yeah. I heard Wes Montgomery right. do some <laughs> covers on some things, that changed things. I right. hear you. I hear you. Thank indeed, you so much. Indeed. Absolutely. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Antoinette Montague, and um, love that we're here together. The question I have and the hope that I have is an appeal to put music and art back into the schools, especially in the inner city. Absolutely. I have asked any of the politicians running, what are you doing and where is the priority of putting the refinement of our children back where I put my tax money, back where we put our efforts because um, that's needed. So we can't complain their music sucks because we allowed for the third decade for that to be amongst the first of the budget cuts. So I appeal to you at the place and stature where you are to consider embracing that. I recently did a CD called World Peace in the Key of Jazz because I really couldn't take our children being in the street saying, I can't breathe as a protest march. There was a whole music and backdrop to the civil rights movement. So it was, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. So I figured it would appeal to young people and they are embracing it. But most of our jazz stations have played it. Some of them have not. But it is important for us to put that protest music as artists and take that risk 
and be okay with unacceptance, um, but I'm there to just um, really encourage us to have unity as a community, not age discrimination. It is absolutely amazing to me the age discrimination that's happening in Jazzdom right now, the male and female discrimination oh, that yeah. is happening. Oh, there has to be a yeah. spirit of love and, and sense of, of oneness. So a problem with the world is lack of love. The answer is we need more of it. And we at the, the root of generating consciousness and thinking as jazz artists, you know, I just ask that we continue to do that and unify and love. Thank one you the, so one much. Of the first things, one of the first things I did when, when I got a little bit of play in my career was create a beautiful, beautiful organization called the Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance. And uh, we actually raised tens of thousands of dollars to buy instruments to go into the New York City public school system and give them to young people to practice on. We send master teachers. We've been doing this for eight, nine years adding young people into their lives, teaching them, giving them pre-professional training, uh, afrolatinjazz.org, if you want to help out, man, because this stuff doesn't just exist on its own. But we definitely go and take, I take the struggle seriously, man. I go into the classroom. Homes, Take them out, get them in shape, and give them to children. We don't have to wait for the government to just put it in school. T- I got to tell you a funny story. I'm going to read real quickly <clears> about it. The, one of my crowning moments in my career it was not standing in Los Angeles at the Staples Center. It was uh, in a school in Queens. And uh, I was doing a site visit, and I heard some commotion coming out of one of our teachers' rooms, and I thought, uh-oh. I said, we're gonna get thrown out of this school. And I walked in, there was a little girl who got her earring caught in an alto saxophone. Oh, wow. there That's we cool. go. And I said to her, why are you crying? She goes, it's my only set of earrings. <laughs> but I thought of all the things that have made my life valuable, the idea that I was used somehow to put an alto saxophone in the hand of a young person in the middle of a marginalized neighborhood, that is probably the best moment of my life. And jazz in the neighborhood, there's Robin Bell Stevens from Jazzmobile over there. So she's Where's still Robin? fighting the good fight and needs all the support there she can are, get. There you are, Sweetie. How yeah. are you? <laughs> Thank you so much. Mr. Harris, you will have the last question for the evening. Okay, it's great to see you here it's good also. To see everybody. It's good to see the Powell family here downtown. We're on Green Street. I mean, Green at the Green Space. This is directed at Dr. West. Dr. West, he frequents music. We see Dr. West all throughout our music community, and he'll bum rush the stage. I saw him jump up on the stage with Roy Haynes, and he, Dr. West will get on the stage. How's, how, how does it feel, like, you know, you're getting ready, like, a tour don't play with this music. Earl McIntyre was complaining this morning about that music he wrote. What does it feel like you like, you know, you're gonna be in front of all this. How does that feel like? What role do you feel yourself in the, inside of this big sound that's getting ready to go around you? And that tradition of Miles and John Coltrane. Yeah, I just hope somebody's praying for me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're absolutely right. On the one hand, of course, you're just eager to be in the mix. On the other hand, it's the one of vulnerability, invincibility, acknowledging that you could fall on your face, but that's all right, because you're going to bounce back swinging. We were talking in the room, and that just don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that sting. You see, because you got to be able to hit it. And you want to hit it in such a way that you have your hit, because your hit is different than somebody else's hit, which means you have to have the courage to be yourself. You got to have the courage to be true to yourself. I think this is one of the challenges of the younger generation, because without the instruments, they, they depended on the computers. You can't get a drummer song on the computers, you see. Clyde, Clyde Stubblefield can't play like the computer, because the computer is not good enough when it comes to Clyde, mm-hmm. because Clyde's soul is in it. You see. But that's imitation. The younger generation, very few bands. In fact, and, and there's a sense in which the last band of the younger generation is on television called The Roots. Very few groups like the Dramatics, the Delphonics, or Marvelettes, or Midnight Star, Atlantic Star, they all individuated because that's at atomistic individualism at work in the recording industry. That's part of the spiritual war against young folk. How are you going to have a generation of young folk that can't play instruments and you listen to the radio, a lot of them can't sing in tune, and they still make a million dollars. And Carmen McRae turns over in her grave. Luther Randolph turns over in his grave. Nat King Cole turns over in his grave. So does Natalie, too because we had the highest standards. 
But it's no longer about standards, it's just about cash. You see? So what happens in that situation? Well, you got spiritual emptiness sets in, the market takes over. You can't have a movement, you can't have a political movement without the spirit. And the spirit will not descend without song. Which means if the song is not right, you're gonna end up with a certain kind of spiritual malnutrition, moral constipation. And that's partly what we're dealing with. And that's why when you step on that stage, that's in part what the Apollo's about. The highest level of what the Greeks call arate, excellence, capital E, but doing it with a smile, with style. And so just to be one little small, small part of that tradition with this magnificent brother, Lord, so we got that wonderful Latino pan, Latin pan, African deeply human activity going on at the Apollo, shoot, if I drop dead Saturday night, I'm going with a smile on my face. <laughs> I'm going right there with you, man. <laughs> We're going together. We're going together. The series is Jazz and Spirit. It's Saturday, <laughs> May 21st at 8 p.m. at the Apollo. Arturo, would you do us the kind honor of closing us out? with some music. I believe we will. I believe that maybe uh, if the spirit is right and the ambiance in the room is correct and the moon is in the right phase, <laughs> Dr. Cornell West will join us. That's excellent. <laughs> and I don't know what we're gonna do, but it'll be it'll vulnerable, be. it'll be love, and it'll be respect. I want to thank Arturo O'Farrell and Cornell West for joining me here for such a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you, too, for joining in. The Cornell West Concerto premieres on Saturday, May 21st at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. Thank you, sir. Thank it's a you. pleasure, so pleasure, much. pleasure thank to meet you. Thank you so much. I'm blessed for y'all to be here at the Green Space. We want to thank our dear sister Helga Davis for being so eloquent for allowing us to come together. We on our way to 125th Street in Harlem, the cultural capital of the American Empire. It's going to be Saturday night. They call it the Cornell West Concerto, but it's more than that. It's about a tradition of a people who straighten their backs up. And any time folks straighten their backs up, they're going somewhere to provoke, ride your back unless it's bent. Are you ready to straighten your back up on Saturday night here yeah, in the green space? Do I hear you in the green space?
in keeping the grand institution alive. Thank you, Sister Laura, for being the associate producer. Thank you all for being here tonight. And let us groove and remember in the end, if you don't throw down, what's coming at you can crush you. But if you're strong, together we can not just overcome, we can change the world. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for having me here. And uh, get your tickets, for those of you who haven't gotten your tickets yet. Again, it's Saturday, May 21st at 8 p.m. at the Apollo. I'm Helga Davis for Q2 Music. Thank you to all of the Green Space staff. What a wonderful coming together. I don't take it for granted. Thank you. Have a great evening.